Welcome to Emmanuel Mennonite Church's summer road trip, as we are on the road visiting other Mennonite churches in British Columbia. I am Maria Weintz, and today we are visiting Cedar Valley Mennonite Church in Mission. Please check your bulletin for any upcoming events. Before we join Cedar Valley, I would like to open with a call to worship, written by Beth Merrill Neal. We come to you, O God, to thank you for what is good. We come to you, O God, to cry out for what is wrong. We come to you, O God, to ask for help and restoration. We come to you, O God, with aching hearts and glad souls. Let us worship God. Hey, good morning everybody. Good morning Cedar Valley and a special welcome this morning to Emmanuel Mennonite Church out in Abbotsford. They are joining us online. I think they're on their own feeds as well, but maybe they're here in the comments. Uh, happy to have you here with us, but really for everyone, we're excited that you're here. My name is Grant. And my name is Teresa. And we are here to get the service started for you this morning. And if this is your first time here, a special welcome to you. We'd love to know you better. So you can help us by giving a shout out um, at hello at cedarvalley.ca or even just dropping a comment here. And for everyone joining in, one of the best ways to stay informed about the different things happening uh, around our church throughout the week, devotional posts, prayer stuff, uh, fun events and updates about what's coming up for Sunday, follow us on Instagram, Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel, or head over to our website, that's cedarvalley.ca, and sign up for our weekly email newsletter. On Fridays, we send that out, a kind of compilation of all the things worth knowing coming up here. Yeah, lots of ways to reach out. And if you've been impacted by our services, spread the news, mm -hmm. hit that share button, and invite your friends and family to join us this morning at church. Absolutely. So a few things coming up here. Uh, one of the things we're doing this summer that's really fun is Wednesday nights, we're doing like a drop-in kind of summer games night. So that's every Wednesday, seven o'clock to 8.30 in the evenings. We've got stuff for kids, toddlers, youth, adults, everybody under the sun, games, hockey, doing some field games, there's some skateboarding, there's craft snacks. It's a really good night. Uh, totally drop in, totally welcome free. And so far, I think we've had a couple of them already. Really good time just to connect, just to hang out. And uh, the weather's been great this summer too. So come out for those Wednesday nights. Awesome. Uh, next announcement is great for bookworms like me. Um, the Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe series. Uh, this is our summer book reading. Last summer, we had our teachers read out some fantastic kids books. Um, and we did that every week online. This year, we're going through a longer book um, and we're going chapter by chapter reading The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis. And we're posting these on YouTube every Sunday. Mm, it's super fun. And uh, one thing we're kind of inviting you to do, it's really fun to join in, read along if you got the book, but if you make a post showing 
just however you are enjoying these videos, however you're engaging, maybe you're watching on your tablet or you're reading along with it or you're just gathered around with some siblings and watching the TV each of these Sunday evenings, make a post, tag the church in it or use the hashtag Cedar Valley Mission and we are giving away a bunch of these books throughout the summer because we just want to like spread it. It's such a good story. And at the end of the summer, for everyone who's put up those submissions too, we're giving away an entire set of the Chronicles of Narnia because this is just one part of this like seven book series. Yeah. Really fun. So yeah, great thing. Awesome. We are so thankful for your ongoing support of the work at the church mm -hmm. um, through prayer, service, time, and financial giving. We believe that a very real part of our worship and serving God means trusting God with our finances and supporting the work of spreading the good news of Jesus. Mm. Absolutely. And so if you have come this morning prepared to give in that way, uh, we do have a few ways of doing that online. You can head to cedarvalley.ca slash give. There's a few different ways of doing that, whatever is easiest for you for donations. Uh, or if you're here in person in the back of your chairs, there's a seat card that kind of gives some information for that. Or there's a debit machine at the far back wall too with some boxes for donation drops. Uh, all in all, there's so many ways to support this kind of work in ministry. That's just one of them, right? Prayer time, all the stuff. We're really appreciative of the way we've been able to, as a church, continue thriving through this whole season and forward. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, let's start this morning off with time of prayer. Yeah. So join me in that. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for uh, this day, God, uh, this week that we just have been able to gather in person, seeing each other's faces. We're able to do some more family gatherings, God, and that there's also still a lot of great provisions. We've learned so many different techniques to gather safely as well for those of us who are uh, still worried of our health. God, maybe we haven't been able to the chance to get vaccinated yet, or we have other health complications, or God, we just aren't quite ready to get into the situation. It's been so long, but we see you present constantly, and we thank you for that, and we're so thankful for it. God, I pray that you bless and multiply the offering that's been uh, just given faithfully here to the work in Ministry of Cedar Valley, that you give us wisdom of how to apply that into our community, how to spread your gospel further forward. Uh, God, there's been some health concerns this past week, too, and I just pray in those families, you know those situations well, you know the families, and you can be present. God, we pray that your name is glorified in those moments that your comfort, your passion, your love is present in people's lives as they deal with surgeries, as they deal with passing from health complications, God. Uh, we pray that you're present in that. Uh, but in all these things, God, please give us the constant sense that you are there, you are a comforter, God, you're a healer, you are with us, that we can turn to you and we can come to you with these things and you should be our first line, not our only line, God, because you empower us as well to reach out and help others. So when we get that urge to support somebody who's hurting near us too, give us a strength and that guidance to do that. God, we pray these things in your name, amen. Amen. All right, let's get the service started. Um, we're gonna start with a time of worship, singing with some songs that's recorded by our worship team. The lyrics will be on the screen so you can follow along, and we invite you to join in the singing however you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. And after that, we have a special lesson just for the kids with Pastor Doug, it's gonna be really fun. He's, he's been learning some sweet tricks to get, help bring the Bible lessons that we're going through to life. I'm excited for that. And we also try to get out uh, email materials to you each week uh, just ways to engage in faith conversations at home with your kids. And if you want to get on that list, email Pastor Doug, that's douglas at cedarvalley.ca and we'll make sure we get those out to you. All right, and this morning we're getting into our summer series on evangelism or sharing the gospel. Yeah, that, that's it. So these are share buttons, by the way. Uh, one of the many kind of styles. I think that's like the Android YouTube share button style. So And Pastor series. Rob is going to be bringing us the message on that today. Absolutely. But before we get into all of that, uh, if you are watching live or if you're here in person too, uh, take a moment, chat with a neighbor or just yell it out loud or hit the comment section of Facebook or YouTube. So we are getting into this whole series on evangelism. The whole point is we believe there's this heart that is something that needs to be shared. And I thought, let's just start off with thinking about what is something that you really like to share? So I know for me, I'll just say this, like often people are gonna say food. I actually like eating by myself sometimes. That's the thing I have to, you know, if I wanna like share food or make a meal with my wife, right? That's, uh, I gotta go outside of that. I like eating by myself, but I really like, I don't play video games very much, but whenever I do, I don't like playing video games by myself. I like to show somebody else. I like to play with somebody else. I like to kind of do multiplayer stuff. So that's what I like to share. What do you like to share? Okay, um, I really like to share funny anecdotes. I like to know like how people, I love to laugh, <laughs> right? And so I love to laugh with people, be able to share um, funny experiences with, uh, with others. So, so I'd love to share some jokes, some, some real experience um, on, uh, online and uh, awesome. or like together in person. And uh, that's it, funny I stories. I love that. Oh man, well yeah, that's great. Sharing jokes is super fun. 
Let us know what you like to share. Other than that, we're in for a great morning. Thanks, Cedar Valley.
Hey Cedar Valley kids, I hope you are having some fun in the summer sun. What a great start to summer and hopefully you're in the water a lot. Anyways, it is great to be back here on Sunday again and I have something for you this morning to check out. Now, I've got a piece of rope here. It's just a regular rope. It's solid. There's no breaks or cuts in it. One piece. Let's just say this rope is you. Yeah, you're pretty cool, you're pretty good looking, and you're hanging out having lots of fun. But you know, sometimes um, we do things that we shouldn't do. Maybe we say something that's not kind, or we do something that's maybe a little mean, or we don't listen to mom and dad like we should. Well, that wrongdoing, that's a problem. Because Jesus says that we should follow and obey him. And actually, if we're not perfect, then, well, then we have a problem still staying connected to God. So if we do something wrong, then our, our life kind of gets bent and it kind of gets twisted up a little bit. And... Uh, And then what can happen is those wrong things. Well, now we've got lots of loose ends that we really shouldn't have if we're going to stay together in uh, like we should. So um, if we take one piece down like this to shortcut and our other piece right here like this. Now, see, we don't look quite like we used to, do we? Um, there's two pieces of us now, but we try to fix ourselves. We try to make things work out right, and we try to say, well, we're sorry, and, but maybe we do something bad again, and, and that's no good, and we feel really bad. But then our life is, well, when we try to fix it, it kind of looks like this. It's not like we were before, but then Jesus comes along and it says in 1 Peter 5 verse 10, Jesus restores us and makes us strong. How cool is that? So, you know what happens here? So this is Jesus back in our life because Jesus lived and died and rose again and he lives inside of us today and for eternity. And well, what happens to us, two pieces broken, not inside, it's not very good. Well, Jesus, we can just move that knot right out of there. And we can move it this way if we want. And you know what? We can just take it right off. <laughs> and look at that. We are restored like we were before. And that's not a trick. I can pull really tight. And we're restored and Jesus makes us strong. How cool is that? Now, this was just a trick. But what Jesus does in our life is no trick. So why do I follow Jesus? Well, one of the reasons is because he restores me to God so that I can live with him today and forever. Thanks for listening so well, kids. We will see you next week. But how can people call on him for help if they have not believed? And how can they believe in one? In one they've not yet heard of. And how can they hear? How can they hear? And how can they hear the message of life? The message of life. And how can they hear the message of life? if there's no one there to proclaim it. All right, good morning, Cedar Valley. And I want a special shout out to Emmanuel Mennonite Church in Abbotsford who are joining us live stream on what they are calling their virtual road trip to different churches uh, in the area. So welcome to you especially. It's kind of cool, actually. We are beginning a, an eight-week summer teaching series, um, which is about the why and the what. 
and the how of sharing our faith with others, what some refer to as evangelism. Okay, so there it is. There's that word, evangelism. Oh boy, okay. Um, so it's a kind of bipolar word for a lot of Christians, meaning we have the sense that we are called by Jesus to share our faith with others, but lots of Christians, maybe most, are sort of scared spitless to share their faith. And so they just, they just don't. And then there's all kinds of negative baggage associated with this word outside of Christianity as well, from those who have left the church to those who have never set their foot inside a church building, from a growing number of ex-evangelicals to those who hold to a kind of caricature of evangelicals, those people who are trying to figure out and take seriously what evangelism is. And, and they're characterized like this as loud, manipulative, narrow-minded, regressive, judgmental crazies. And all this is kind of brutal. So we tend to not talk about evangelism, which is, which is really too bad because of all this negative baggage. Evangelism is, is actually a really positive term, at least from a Christian perspective. We get our English word for evangelism from the Greek word euangelion. Euangelion is a noun that is usually translated gospel, but should probably be translated and is a better translation to think of it as good news, like good news, because that's literally what the word means. Interestingly, when Jesus and his disciples used the word Euangelion, and man, it's such a fun word to say. They were co-opting a non-religious term of the day. It was an extremely political word at the time, referring to kings and kingdoms and the announcements of their related victories and how the order and power and riches of those kingdoms brought, quote unquote, good news for those who were faithful to that kingdom. Here's a part of one of many examples of such an announcement at that time, an euangelion of that age, called the Priene Inscription. And I'm quoting here now, starting here. Since Providence has set in most perfect order by giving us Augustus, whom she filled, Providence being a female, and this is the one that filled with virtue that he might benefit humankind, sending him as a savior, both for us and for our descendants, that he might end war and arrange all things. And since he, Caesar, and inherent from this Lord, by this appearance, surpassing all previous benefactors and not even leaving to posterity any hope of surpassing what he has done. And since the birthday of the God, the God, God, Augustus, was the beginning of the good tidings for the world that came by reason of him. So it's in this context, the euangelion was an announcement of a king or, or a lord or a god or a savior and his kingdom. The New Testament writers of the Bible co-opted this term to talk about Jesus as king, as God, as son of God, as savior, as Lord of all. But here are a couple of crucial differences between Jesus and Caesar. Jesus, uh, well, Jesus is God, Caesar not. Jesus is God by virtue of his extraordinary life and his unique teachings and the miracles he performed, not by virtue of conquering lands and killing innocents and eliminating opposition. The good news of Caesar Augustus and his kingdom was actually really bad news for those who opposed him. His victories were over the less powerful. He was a savior only to those who unwillingly bent themselves to the selfish expansion of his kingdom. The good news of Jesus, however, is good news like, for everyone. His victory is in favor of the powerless. His victory 
is over sin and death for those who would freely choose to follow him and make him king in their lives. His kingdom is marked by love and forgiveness. This, of course, would have been an affront to the good news of Caesar, an attack even really on the Roman Empire of the time and of Caesar as Lord. So when we speak of evangelism in this series, it's in this context, actually, of euangelion, of good news, something that has happened that is very good. And that good news is this, that God is for us, that his son, Jesus, embodies God's love for us through his victory over sin and death, and that Jesus is King and Lord of all. That is what Christians get to talk about because we believe it, because we are trying our best to live it. But we also, like we also need to say it. So for this reason, we, that's me, Pastor Doug and Pastor Grant, have chosen this anchor verse for this teaching series as it came to us separately, actually, and landed there in our spirit. But how can people call on him for help if they've not yet believed? And how can they believe in one they've never heard of? And how can they hear the message of life if there is no one there to proclaim it and we are to proclaim it? I'm taking, I really like the clarity of this version, the Passion Translation from Romans 10, 14. It's so simple. So It's so logical, isn't it? People cannot know the good news of what God has done for them if they've never heard of him, if we don't share our faith with others in thoughtful and relevant ways, which reminds me of this old story. Um, something atheist Penn Gillette of Penn and Teller, they are a pair of Vegas musicians, he said sometime after a show when an audience member gave him a Gideon's Old or New Testament, he said this, and I'm quoting now, if you Christians believe that there's a heaven and a hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life or, or whatever, and, and you think it's not really worth telling them it's because it wouldn't like it'd be, make it socially awkward, how much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? If I believed beyond a shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it, and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point at which when I would just, I would just tackle you. And this is more important than that. So that's what we're going to talk about this summer. Why and what and how we talk about good news. Let's start with why. There's a church in my neighborhood that has a boulevard sign on it that says, come follow me, Jesus. And I read it that way and I say it that way because that's how it's punctuated. As in, there's no punctuation. This is a sad little side effect of my teaching life that my brain gets sort of hung up on punctuation once in a while. Like that book titled back in 2003, uh, Eats, Shoots, and Leaves. You may remember this. It was a pretty famous BBC writer. Uh, do you see the problem with this here? Eats, comma, shoots, and leaves. And there's the title. And there's the author by Lynn Truss. It's actually, it's what's called a syntactic ambiguity. It's a verbal falsehood arising from really poor grammatical construction derived from a variant of a bar joke, if you can believe it, that goes something like this. You gotta do a bar joke Sunday morning. A panda walks into a cafe. He orders a sandwich, eats it, then draws a gun and fires two shots in the air. Why? Asked the confused waiter as the panda makes towards the exit. The panda produces a badly punctuated wildlife manual and tosses it over his shoulder. I'm a panda, he says at the door. Look it up. The waiter turns to the relevant entry in the manual and sure enough finds an explanation, quoting, panda, large black and white bear-like animal, native China, eats, comma, shoots, comma, and leaves. The punchline is in the final sentence. There shouldn't be any commas. Pandas eat, shoots, and leaves. They don't eat, then shoot, 
and leave. I think we could guess that what the church's boulevard sign intends is to attribute the quote, come follow me, to Jesus. But as I've walked by that sign on my daily walk, I have wondered if its unintended meaning might be truer still, that all too often, as followers of Jesus, it is we who invite Jesus to follow us, not vice versa. Why follow Jesus? Like, why follow Jesus? Why not just let him follow us? Well, I can't answer that question for you, though at the end of this teaching, you'll have a chance to answer it for yourself and to share that answer with someone else. Here are some of the reasons why I follow Jesus. I'm just drawn to the person of Jesus. Now, it's not like I meet Jesus for coffee at Tim Hortons once a week for a spiritual top-up. I don't drink coffee. It's more like I believe in the historical person of Jesus as attested to by Jewish and Roman historians, people like Flavius Josephus, Pliny, Tacitus, like within decades of Jesus' life, and as written by in the four biographical eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life in the Bible, known collectively, ironically, as the Gospels, which are narrations of the life of Jesus and his good news. Josephus referred to James, the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ. Pliny reported that Christians worshipped Jesus as God. And Tacitus talked about Jesus' execution during the time of Pontius Pilate. These non- and somewhat anti-Christian historians kind of established the existence, the historical validity of Jesus. The gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, established Jesus' character. There's a story of Jesus leaving Galilee for the final time, and he's heading to Jerusalem. He's confronted by, <laughs> as he was often, some religious leaders who just grilled him about divorce. At the same time, children started piling, and they were brought to Jesus, maybe by their parents, to be blessed by him. But his disciples went all sort of security team on everyone and turned them away. Jesus said, and I'm quoting from Matthew chapter 19, verses 14 and 15, let, let the little children come to me. Don't hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he placed his hands on them, he went on from there. It's important to remember that children were considered to hold the lowest possible human status in the ancient world. So the disciples probably felt like they were doing the right thing in keeping the children from Jesus, insulating him from those who should be seen and not heard. But Jesus would have none of it. He welcomed them. He blessed them. Those who were otherwise sometimes loved and sometimes exploited because Jesus is inclusive. There's another story of Jesus meeting a woman at a well. He, a male Jewish rabbi, and she, a female Samaritan with a bad reputation. In the ancient world, men were not to talk to women in public. Jews were forbidden to talk to Samaritans, and rabbis would never associate with someone who was known to be amoral. But Jesus crossed all the lines. Why? Because Jesus is a king for everyone, and his kingdom is a kingdom for everyone. Second thing, I, I'm amazed by the teachings of Jesus. And I'm not the only one. Here's what the Bible says at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, one of the most famous teachings in all of literature. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teachings. This is Matthew chapter 7, verse 29. Because he taught as one who had authority and not as one of the teachers of the law. Jesus taught with authority. In this text, Matthew, the gospel writer, is contrasting the teaching of Jesus with the teachings of all the other teachers of the law of their time. The teachers of the law were the Jewish scholars of the day, professionally trained in the development, teaching, and application of the Old Testament law. Their authority was strictly human and it was traditional. They quoted other rabbis to support their own teaching, sort of like when I might quote an author or a scholar in support of a teaching that I'm sharing. But Jesus spoke with divine authority. 
In other words, Jesus wasn't, he, Jesus wasn't quoting other teachers that allowed to make his point. He was quoting God. So when he taught, he taught like nobody else. Whether it was a sermon or an object lesson or when he was answering a question. Like when a group of religious leaders asked him, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus knew their hypocrisy. Why, like, why are you trying to trap me, he asked. Bring, bring to me a denarius and let me look at it. They brought the coin and he asked them, whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. And they were amazed. I, I mean, but it gets even better. So to not offend Caesar or his tax collectors, Jesus says to Peter in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 27, go to the lake and throw out your line. Take the first catch, open its mouth, and you will find a four drachma coin. Take it and give it to them for my tax and yours, Peter. Come on, that's, that, that's just so good. Or like my favorite teaching moment in all of the Bible. Again, the religious leaders of his day brought an adulterer to Jesus to have him judge her. Would Jesus side with the Jews or would he side with the Romans? So it's like this. Roman law prohibited Jews to carry out death sentences. So if Jesus had said, I had a stoner, as the Jewish law permitted, then he'd have a problem with the Romans. If Jesus said to not stone her, he would have been accused of violating Jewish law. So as you can tell, Jesus was in a bit of a pickle here. The leaders kept questioning him. The crowd is hot for an answer. Jesus, though, bent down and just sort of wrote on the ground with his finger. And he straightened up and he said to them, you know, if any one of you is without sin, uh, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. I mean, come on! That's so good, right? Third reason. I follow Jesus, and there's more than three. These are the three I'll share with you this morning. I am like gobsmacked by the miracles of Jesus. And I just wanted to put the word gobsmacked in there, which means like, uh, wow. Uh, like, yeah. It, if the Bible is to be believed, and I say, why not? Then the Gospels are a record of the person of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, but then they are also a record of the testimony that Jesus is God. Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus healed a paralytic. Jesus raised a widow's son from the dead. Jesus calmed a raging storm on the sea. Jesus healed two blind men. Jesus fed more than 5,000 people with two loaves of bread and five fish. I mean, who does this stuff? Only someone who has the power over life and death. Only God. The gospel writer John says in his biography of Jesus that Jesus did, and I'm quoting in John chapter 20, verses 30 to 31, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded in this book, John's book. But these, the ones that made the cut for John's book, are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, a king for everyone and a kingdom for everyone. Jesus said, follow me 13 times in the Gospels. Some did, some didn't. Some still do and some still don't. I do because I am drawn to him as a person, because I'm amazed by his teachings, and because I believe that he is God, Savior, and Lord of all. Who else would I follow? who would compare to Jesus. Let me finish where we started really quickly. We have begun this teaching series with this question, why follow Jesus for this reason? Because it is the foundation for everything else that follows, and here's why. If we don't know why we follow Jesus, our faith will be shaky, it'll be soft, it'll be vulnerable to breaking down, and it won't be very convincing for those who are searching. So here's the challenge. Through this series, through the summer, each week there'll be a challenge that is an application. It's going to get some shoe leather to the teaching. And it is simply this. Simple, but not necessarily easy, as are most of these challenges. Write out why you follow Jesus. Like I've explained here, write out why you follow Jesus and then share it with someone. 
I'm going to close in prayer, and then in a moment, Pastor Grant's going to come, and we're going to talk a little bit about what this might look like and, and why we've asked you to tackle this question and journal it and make yourself ready to share it. So just hang tight for that. Let's pray. Father, I will concede that it, it's, it's by faith that I follow. There's, there's good reason. As, and I'm not trying to give evidence to compel someone, but I, I'm, I'm speaking from my heart that I, I, I follow Jesus because I just find him to be this incredibly attractive person like, as he is and his teachings so different and transforming. And then, of course, by faith, I believe that he is God. He says as much in the Gospels, and it is why he was killed. For those of us, Father, who have been following Jesus for a while, I pray that we would be in encouraged today to think again about why we do. And I think that's... Uh, an evolving thing. I think there's always reasons we can add as our, our faith grows and as our, our heart changes and as we uh, interact with new thoughts. For those who are still wondering, that's, that's cool. I, I pray that they would uh, search, honestly, ask good questions and that we'd be ready for them. Those of us who are on that pathway, we don't have all the answers, that's for sure. But we'd love to have the conversations. Help us to write our story out of why and we follow you and what that looks like so that we'd be just ready to talk about that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Peace, Cedar Valley, and Emmanuel Mennonite. Hey, thanks for joining us, everybody. And uh, yeah, for Emmanuel joining in this morning too, really good time. I know I think you guys are on a different stream too, but this is a time that we just want to make sure that this Sunday morning isn't just about watching a stream. It's not just about consuming, right? That's a huge yeah. thing. This whole past year, I think we've massively learned that this church thing isn't about a service. It's actually something that we want to take. It's great to learn and worship and pray together on Sunday morning and then wrestle with it and learn from it and actually apply it immediately, like right now and tomorrow and the rest of this week. Yeah. Yeah, so we're going to jam a bit on this. You've got a question or a challenge for us uh, yeah, this week. Yeah, as we will through yeah. the course of the series, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. And so, like, write out why you follow Jesus and share your thoughts with someone else. So there's two pieces here, it's right? Yeah. So write it, but then share it. What do you, like, what, how, so how would you go about doing that? And, yeah. and do, you have, do you have someone in mind that you had picked? Like, oh, I'll share with them because they're safe and they won't crush me if I, like, yeah, what yeah. are you well, thinking? So, and because this is like, I know this is going to be a new thing for a lot of us. I like that you clarified too, like someone's safe, maybe like as they're starting, yeah, right? Like, yeah, yeah, maybe. Or, or just kick right into the deep end. <laughs> like, hey, why do you like Jesus? Go tell so-and-so who's yeah. never met him before. No, it's, yeah. um, I've done a challenge like, or an exercise like this before too, which is really good. Cause I think often we don't even know the answer, how to answer that question simply. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I would really like to share that with, uh, I've got a couple friends from high school that I still connect with regularly. There's a bit of a mountain biking group I do sometimes and some other friends in there. We'll often chat about churchy stuff, but often it's kind of been brushed off the side of like, oh, that's fine, you guys go to church stuff. And we don't actually really profess too often of like, why do I actually care? Yes, right? yes, um, yes. And I know, a and big, it should be yeah. natural. I think I'm reminded totally. of a quote a long time ago by Rob Bell. He'd said, "We don't defend the things we love." Yeah, right. And by that, I, I love Jesus. I I said it differently. I follow him, but I follow him because I love him. And I don't. I don't have. To, I, I, I Jesus. I don't have to. Do it. Yeah. If I if I love Jesus, who, who, and I do, I just talk about him pretty easily, right? Without defending him, yeah, yeah, or even myself. It's, it's super easy. This is going to come up a lot this series when there's a movie you're super into or a board game you find or a book or a food. Yeah. You discover a new restaurant, right? How easily you talk about those things. So easily. Right? And so that's actually, so I was going to say, that was what I found out of that exercise too, is they said, so find three things that you love telling people about, right? Like what's your favorite movie? What's your favorite food? What's your favorite thing oh. to do? Write out the top three things or whatever of why you like those things. And I said, translate that to your relationship with Jesus. So it's like, oh, I like this movie because it tells me this thing about my life and I care about this in the world. Or I like this food because it honestly is so good for me or it's nourishing or refreshing, right? Yeah. And then start like seeing that. that. Does that translate at all to your relationship with Jesus, right? Does he impact your life on a regular basis? Mm. Uh, I know a huge mm. one for me, that's a big one for Jesus too, is exactly what you said, the, that reality of him as a teacher, the stuff he taught that it was recorded throughout history was mind-blowing to people. He had this authority that blew everyone's mind that even to this day, 
A lot of people will say, yeah, I respect the teachings of Jesus, whether they believe in him as a savior or not. Yep. yep. So he has some validity there, but the big one that's wild to me, and it, it comes out of the Bible, it comes out of a real relationship I've had with Jesus for years too, is uh, nobody else, my wife who is absolutely incredible, my parents who are forgiving and patient with me like crazy, but nobody is as tolerant as Jesus <laughs> in my life for the amount of times I ignore him, I do my own thing for <laughs> months too. at a time. Me too. And then it's both recorded in the Bible and in through prayer and times with him is like yeah. waiting for us with open arms to come back to. Yeah. Is just incredible, right? And yeah. When you start experiencing that real relationship, and I hope that something like this comes out for all of you guys watching in, that there's a real experience and if you haven't got that like there is a real relationship with Jesus you can have and it can be like a real visceral impacting yeah. thing as close to I am with my wife. In fact I think I might make the argument if it isn't then I'd wonder about the nature of your understanding mm -hmm. and your relationship with Jesus. If it's not in your life, if it isn't present, if it isn't evolving, if it mm -hmm. isn't transforming. Mm -hmm. I think that's a lot to go on hey? We got some yeah, challenge I, here. I think it's not a bad idea to maybe even start the way you suggested to list those things that you said and totally write out how, in, but then to, to translate that into why you follow Jesus. Yeah. And the reason I, we've started here, I mentioned it earlier because it's the foundation for everything that follows, but to say it is to practice that anchor verse mm -hmm. with something that mm -hmm. you like and is easy to talk about because so, you never know when you might get that chance. A, but apart from that, just knowing it and practicing it with someone will make you ready for that chance, right? Yeah. Because I, I think if you, if, you, if you position yourself for it, I think those chances come. Yeah. Don't you? Yeah. 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 All right. So, hey, for everyone joining in, uh, if you're online, throw some of your thoughts even in the comment section too. If you're yeah. kind of joining in with a small group at home or if you're with your family, friends, dialogue a little bit about that. If you're here in person, uh, turn to your neighbor, mingle a little bit after the service. It's a great time and, and share some of your immediate thoughts right away. We're going to be present around, ready to answer stuff both online and in person and we just love to hear that dialogue go. But other than that, thanks for coming and we'll see you next week.
thank you for joining Emmanuel's visit to Cedar Valley Mennonite Church. Next week, we will be worshiping with Ebenezer Church here in Abbotsford.